back again. Hi, friends. This was an amazing, um, this amazing um, talk by Rem Kohlhaas. And now we have a conversation between two titans, DLD All-Star titans. I'm so proud. I'm really proud to welcome two acclaimed investors and entrepreneurs who have shaped the digital economy fundamentally. Ben Horowitz, the co-founder and general partner of the VC firm, of the very renowned VC firm, Andreessen Horowitz, here. As you remember, last night we had a session on Clubhouse, which is just one of the firm's latest hot investments. Ben is also the author of the New York Times bestseller book, The Hard Things About Hard Things. And what you do is who you are. Here. What you do is what you are. And if you are looking, by the way, this inspired the session, of course, what you do is what you are. If you are looking for poignant and cutting edge advice on how to build, lead and run a company, I really recommend Ben's books and his blogs and his insights. You have to follow this guy. Ben also created a A16Z cultural leadership fund to connect the greatest cultural leaders to the best new technology companies and enable more young African Americans to enter the technology industry. By the way, when I first met Ben Horowitz, I learned so much from him from boxing and from rap music. Remember, Ben, when you brought to us Rap Genius? This was an amazing company with amazing founders, a little bit crazy, but they learned me first time about the context and connotation of, of, um, of software, of, of, of internet coding, connotations. Um, now you are uh, um, following young African Americans to enter the technology industry, and it's, I think it's, it's so, and, and in times of Black Lives Matter, it's such an important effort, and you, you have, you have really, we have to learn much more about what Ben is doing. Ben will be joined by Nicholas Tenstrom, CNO and founding partner of the VC firm Atomico. Nicholas and I, and Nicholas and DLD, go way back. He first spoke at DLD in 2006. Remember, Nicholas? The second, yeah. the second, the very second DLD conference. And so we all know Nicholas as the co founder of Skype, but it's a long time ago. You have an interesting painting behind you. You have to explain us what it is. As an investor, Niklas is focusing on companies mainly out of Europe who want to solve big challenges facing our planet with digital technology. Over 10 Atomico portfolios, companies have reached unicorns, 10 portfolio companies have reached unicorn status to date. I, I'm, sh I'm sure, Ben, you can you can um, compete with this. Uh, later on, maybe we will. <laughs> Nicholas and his wife, Catherine, have also founded Zenstrom Philanthropies, which supports projects in the fields of human rights and ecology. Ben, say hello to Felicia. Oh, I will definitely do that, and it's great to Catherine see you. Catherine and Felicia, you have a big part in, in the success of your husband. So yeah, my best regards to them. Normally, at least one secret. day, one day, my friends, we will do an, a session on the wives of an successful, of successful entrepreneurs. How to make an entrepreneur uh, sex, so sex, not sexy, successful with the help of their wives, okay, or their husbands. So, guys, let's dive into a first question. Niklas Ben, a successful entrepreneurs and investors, you know quite a lot about good products, good investments, good people, and good leadership. What are the critical blocks for a successful, solid business from your point of view? The floor is yours. Nicholas, you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, thank you. So first of all, it's great to be here. And, and I cannot believe it was such a long, such long time ago, but it's uh, it's a lot of things that happened since then, and and one thing that's for sure is that we uh, witnessed so many very very successful companies since between that first DLD or the second one that I was at and and today. And and what's exciting is about as we're going to see so many more in the future. And 
I think on, on that one, what a successful business is, there's a lot of things, you know, timing is one thing and, and, and having a long-term view, uh, vision and, and, and being kind of um, original thinking. But the one thing that I come down to is, is really the team. Uh, it's, it's always a decisive factor because there's so many, there's so many things that would change along the way. There's like whatever the plan a founding team has is going to change. And, 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 uh, and, and it's, so it's the team, and, and when I say the team, is it starts with the founders because they're the, like the nucleus of, of that team. And for them then to build a really strong team around them, but the team is just a set of people if you don't have what unites them, and which is really the, the culture. And I think that's really what, what makes successful companies very successful. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a great point and one that, um, you know, people miss because when we think about companies, we think about the outcomes um, and not, not only the long term outcome, but the, you know, the quarterly goals and objectives, the, you know, OKRs and KPIs and all these things. But the thing that happens constantly <laughs> in a company is the kind of culture, the set of behaviors, how you treat each other, what it's like to work there, how you treat the partners, you know, what is the kind of norm of how you conduct yourself. And it's interesting, you know, Nicholas and I have been around a while. And one thing I always say to entrepreneurs is, you know, the most important thing about this company isn't going to be how much money you make or what the outcome is and so forth. And it's going to be the time, uh, the time you spent, because everybody in that company, their whole working, waking life, you know, the bulk of it while they're there is going to be spent on the company. And if that time is amazing and great and enhances their lives, then that's a good outcome in itself. And if it's miserable, even if you are a unicorn, um, you know, it, you're perpetuating misery. So it's a, it's a really, really critical point. And it is the thing that sustains it and attracts more people and, yeah. you know, and it builds up the, the, the quality over time. And, and when we'll talk about this in terms of, you know, if we're, I think that now compared to when I started my first company, like we didn't talk about, you know, like data driven and, and mm -hmm. it was we figure things out, but, and it's been more and more kind of very much decision-making is data driven. And, and, and as you say, you have OKRs and other measurements and, but is there, and we try to do that because we want to get that great performance. Yeah. And, and is there, you know, to your point also with the time, but is there also, a trade-off or not here between okay let's that's fine we building these cultures but is it is it a trade-off do you think between being really data performance oriented in terms of the outcomes versus you know spending having you know i don't say if it's like having a good time but 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 uh enjoying the time spent <laughs> well, that, that, that's an interesting thing so well it, it's funny because when you started skype um it was kind of before we had data for these products, right? Yeah. Like now it's assumed like every click somebody makes, wow. you have a recording of it in those days, you know, we didn't have nearly as much data. So there's kind of, you know, first we got the data and then it, yeah. it shifted to this data driven culture. Yeah. And, you know, it is, um, I, I think they're a little orthogonal in, in some ways, um, but I do think that people take data driven too far and that there's yeah. things, look, what you get out of the data is what the people who are currently on the product doing, um, which is very different than the people who, what the people who don't have the product want. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you get caught up into that and it can take you, uh, you know, it can cut off possible paths of product development that are really critical. And there's an interesting kind of experiment uh, going on in Silicon Valley that's been running for a while, which is, you know, Facebook is sort of the ultimate data-driven company <laughs> and Snap kind of oriented itself very much to be the anti-Facebook, including not being data-driven, including, yeah. you know, kind of thinking things about customer experience from first principles, you know, sans the data. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's led them to different kinds of product ideas. Of course, there's copying yeah. <laughs> uh, that goes across that, that, that yeah. converges them somewhat, but that's been, uh, you yeah. know, I think they're both, they both have value, but different. I guess it's about, it's, it's about sometimes you, when you do the big innovations and that's also kind of the, 
entrepreneurs and the founders job to, okay, I'm going to, this is one version of the future I believe in. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and we make those big, big decisions versus kind of refinements. And, but as you said, also when the, the risk with that, those, ex, when we're running these experiments, when, when the algorithms are spinning us in one direction. So I think that's also where, kind of when you come back to culture and values, I think that's also where the culture for me here is a set of shared values. It's what's right, what's wrong. So that, you know, so that the team can stand up and say, actually, you know what? Okay, the data that we have and whatever the objectives is that are giving, show, going in one direction, but mm-hmm. that's not really what we're here for. That's not what we stand for. That's not our mission. And, and I think that's where values, shared values are actually important and, and to course. Uh, yes. Well, this is, so uh, uh, let me add to that because I think you're right. So you get into this thing um, where you can build data-driven addictive products and things like that. You know, you get to these kinds of situations. Um, but it's, you really, the samurai had this great um, idea around culture, which is uh, a culture is not a set of beliefs, it's a set of actions. Yeah. And the challenge is you may have some set of beliefs about how the world should be, but if all your internal incentives and behaviors drive you away from those, then those beliefs aren't, they don't mean anything. Like you oh. could have values on the wall that yeah. that you never follow very easily, and so the challenge in building a company culture is how do you incent the behaviors that reflect the values? Yeah. And if you've got a whole incentive system that's independent of your values, yeah, then you can run into a very yeah. you know, situation. Yeah. yeah, and I think this is also when when these behaviors is also this is also I think the role for. The leadership, the founder, to actually sometimes just makes one or two decisions, which might be really, really hard. Yes, because they might go against short-term objectives or profitability. But but when yeah. they make those decisions, it's going to be difficult. That's also okay. Now that's clear that that value is now implemented in a way. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you know, it's tricky because well. The, Another uh, really good thing from the samurai values is they, they, they there's this uh, thing that they say like in, in ordinary times, uh, matters of character cannot be determined, but when something happens, all is revealed. Yes, and that's really when it costs you something. Yes. That's when you lose your integrity, your honesty, and yes. your values. Until then, no, like nobody can even tell. It's no, sort of like it's just, service. Just, are people honest? Yeah. Well, yeah, as long as, you know, it doesn't cost them their marriage or their job or yeah. <laughs> like a lot of money, then That's they'll true. Kind of, That's true. Yeah. they'll vary off of that very fast otherwise. Yeah. And, and okay. No, no, go, go for it. Yeah, and I, I was going to say also, you know, when you think about the design of the system, you have to think about the incentives that you're counteracting. So like, you know, when we started our firm, you know, one of the, things that I always hated, I know you hated as an entrepreneur, is a lot of venture capitalists were very kind of disrespectful during the fundraising process. Um, And, you know, show up late to meetings and, you know, be on their text the whole time and all this kind of thing. And it's, you know, it's a tricky value to put into your firm because the the, the dynamic leads to that, right? I have money, you need money, you have to see me to get the money. So I feel like I'm more important than you, like yeah. if I'm an individual partner. And so how do you counteract that? And so, you know, at our firm, I instituted like a very strict fine system, you know, $10 yeah. a minute for being late. And the reason was just to kind of reset the behavior against the overriding incentive of the industry. Yeah. And I think that you really have to be thoughtful and intentional, you know, if you're going to move something into the culture, that counteracts the regular business incentives of making money and um, you know, yeah. people wanting personal status and all these yeah. kinds of things. Yeah, no, that's right. It's like thinking through like you know who you're there for, and, and I think that yeah. the good news for us is I think that about the time when you started your firm and we started, the, the kind of balance shifted a little bit. Now we you know since last ten years we seem to be chasing entrepreneurs rather than <laughs> chasing us. <laughs> yeah, no, that's been, uh, you know, I think that's a, a very positive change. In it's the very industry. positive, yeah. It's yeah. always funny to hear VCs complain about, oh, you know, like, you know, these entrepreneurs are so great. It's like that, 
they're actually the main event and we're the supporting yes case. exactly <laughs> we're in the back seat that's yeah. right um so you know one, one thing also you know we, 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 when you and i chat a little bit it's like when we talk about you know cultures and, and behaviors and values um you know some it's it's also kind of different and different or or sometimes it can be easier when you're like really a kind of a very similar team maybe you're all kind of at least in the old days it used to be in the same office <laughs> and and uh everyone's from the same background kind of engineers yeah. maybe one country one city um mm -hmm. and and today we're building companies that are maybe not from the beginning but pretty quickly becomes international global companies but also what's so exciting now is that a lot of the companies that I know that you're investing in VR are also transcending different industries. You're using software and technology to maybe try to transform a non-tech industry. And then you have people from different, you're hiring and you get like the software people, tech people, and you get maybe people from under other industries. How, how do you build, how do you kind of bridge that? Yeah, so that's a really great point because I think a lot of people, you know, particularly in Silicon Valley, you always think, okay, this is the culture for the entire corporation. And as yeah. a company that's large, um, you know, can you live under a complete monoculture is a, is a very important question. And that there was a, you know, a really interesting incident with Amazon. And if you're from Silicon Valley, Amazon is the ultimate scale culture. I mean, it's amazing. It's legendary. Um, you know, they have these things where you have to write a memo for the yeah. meeting, there's no PowerPoint and that has everybody's got a prepared mind. And you know, it's just an amazing kind of uh, culture that they've sustained to a gigantic size. Uh -huh. um, but a few years ago, an article came out in the New York Times saying that like, you know, basically outlining the misery of the Amazon culture and that people were crying at work and this and that and the other and that they hated it uh, and the 12 hour days and all this stuff. And so the reaction from like everybody that I knew was, Wow, that was just a hit piece, and the New York Times doesn't know what they're talking about. The interesting thing about it, though, was the writer of the story, David Streitfeld. I actually know him, and he's a very earnest reporter. So I knew, like, he had to have had something. Uh, and as I came, so I, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what it was. And in talking to people at Amazon, what they said is it actually was a kind of a, a bit of a wake up for them, and that the culture for tech people was amazing. Everybody loved it, but they hired a bunch of people from retail, you know, JC Penney, Nordstrom, Stephen Marcus, uh, and those people had different life, a different kind of thought about what work meant. And so for them, um, you know, the intensity and the hours and so forth was oppressive and they couldn't actually function in it. Yeah. So, you know, Amazon to their credit, I think kind of enabled a kind of retail subculture that yeah. had you know, a lot of the Amazon values, but not every single behavior in Amazon. Yeah. Uh, and I think that, you know, generally companies have this, you know, it, it could be between sales and engineering, which, yeah. you know, culturally there's a lot of differences. You know, yeah. in sales, you can't come to work at 10 a.m. That's not okay. <laughs> you know, you gotta wake up early and, and call the people. So all that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, and, and in those cases, I think there's also about what are then you have those different subcultures, right? But then it's probably important to still have a set of shared, you know, values mm -hmm. across, yeah. and then you kind of trying to define that. It's, it's not trivial, but it's um, and I, you've seen that also with companies, you know, like are using you know computational biology where you have engineers, so, so software people, and then you have people from pharma, very very different mm -hmm. thinking there, yeah. and it's used. Yeah. Absolutely. How, how to bridge that? It's not. It's not trivial for for founders, and specifically now founders who haven't been. Typically, they have only been in one of one of the others. So it's a lot yeah, of. Yeah, well, you're actually marrying right science and engineering, <laughs> and yeah. so what makes sense in science isn't always what makes sense yeah. in engineering in any kind of state. So yeah, yeah that, that, that's so important, and it's the little things in the culture, right? Like there's big things in a culture, like. Um, okay, you know, like we were talking about before, like you have to respect entrepreneurs if you're a venture capitalist and respect yeah. the process of building a company. Okay, that's a universal value. But then there's smaller things about like, okay, what's the time frame in which you get back to people? That's a really yeah. important cultural thing because it, 
leads to you know how you treat people, and that that may be one way in sales, and a different way in engineering, and a different way in science. Yeah, no, that's for sure. And and um, and what, what do you think? You know, is is when you have a, you know founders setting up their companies, and and do you think there's um, you know these things? To, when should they start thinking about these things? Um, yeah, so it's interesting. I think um, you can overemphasize it in that, look, the, the culture is sort of what are the behaviors you want in your company? And a lot of it is what makes you unique. It's not just like, okay, let's grab every value we think is important in life. Yeah. You know, a lot of it comes down to, okay, who are we as a company and where are we going to build cultural competitive advantage? And so kind of an example of this might be, um, okay, you're a security company and you want to have the highest kind of level of integrity and honesty in the company because you want to be the trusted source. And so yeah. then that's got to run through everything you do. And so those things, sometimes they take time to kind of understand your business, understand your position in the market to build. So I, I would just say, like, I think culture is necessarily dynamic in that it's not like the mission statement where you put it up yeah. and leave it for a hundred years. You kind of want to keep updating it and and build it as you go. Yeah. And you find out, okay, here are the behaviors that we have that we really love yeah. and are advantageous for us. And then here are things we want to get rid of. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so like how do we do that? And so as yeah. you define the culture, you have to go through all of those. Yeah. I think that's really important that also kind of what the things you want to get rid of because my experience is like it's it's really the kind of the founding team and the first set of people that you hire when everyone working together and mm -hmm. what they do is kind of setting that initial culture but and then that can also be sometimes you're doing a lot of behavior that maybe it's not appropriate and you scale so that's also kind of okay we what are the things that <laughs> maybe you, you you do but you maybe realize that maybe that's a bad habit and how do you yeah, know absolutely like, 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 yeah yeah no, that, that, that's such a great point guys you know, things I'm, like I'm so right. sorry but I have to interrupt you this I could awesome. hear listen to you for for hours because I think what you just did was a real substance talk it just was not a easy how to do leadership <laughs> culture so it was really deeper it was profound Thank you for making this session a really all-star session, a cool star session. Thank you for being my stars. Well, thank you. Thank you for putting on the best